So uh, the eyelid, of course, as you know, is a uh, is a structure which uh, closes. I mean, protects the eyeball. We have the upper lid and the lower lid. Uh, they contain um, the the basic structure of the eyelid is uh, the basic structure of the eyelid is in terms of uh, layers. There is an anterior layer which is uh, made of mainly skin and subcutaneous tissue. Uh, the skin of the eyelid is does not have uh, subcutaneous fat. This is very important because the lid is uh, very mobile and it needs to be very light for uh, especially blinking purposes. And that the skin is a muscular layer that contains uh, especially the obicularis oculi muscle, which is uh, responsible for the closure of the eyelids. It's uh, innervated by the seventh cranial nerve. And that it uh, is, is mainly the tarsal plate. The tarsal plate is the collagenous layer. And apart from giving the, the eyelid a bit of rigidity, it also has meibomian glands inside. The glands are inside the tarsal plate itself. And then under the tarsal plate is the, is the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva lines, it's on the underside of the tarsal plate, uh, lines the tarsal plate and continues uh, superiorly and reflects back on the eyeball to make what we call the bulbar conjunctiva. We have the inner side of the eyelid as the uh, fibro conjunctiva palpebral conjunctiva under the top of the, uh, uh, underlining the eyeball itself is the, is the, uh, is the bulbar conjunctiva. Uh, innovations of the eyelid, it depends on uh, what you're talking about. The sensory is mainly, uh, it's mainly the ophthalmic uh, artery, that is the maxillary and, and I mean the ophthalmic branch of the maxillary So you talked about the obicularis muscle, which is uh, supplied by the third cranial nerve. There is a small uh, smooth muscle called the Mueller's muscle, which has a smooth uh, muscle. I mean, the, 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 there is a sympathetic uh, innervation to it. And you remember sympathetic uh, nerves goes with blood vessels. The blood supply is mainly from the ophthalmic and the lacrimal arteries. So in short, this is what we are talking about when you're talking about the eyelid. Uh, and lead, lead margin. Uh, there are, of course, the lashes on the anterior part of the, the lead. Then there is a skin. I was talking about the thin skin. And there is obicularis muscle. This represents the obicularis muscle. And then under the obicularis muscle is a, is a tarsal plate. As you go further up, you can see there is a muscle which comes from the orbit. This is called the levator muscle. It is the one now that lifts the eyelid. It is the one that opens the eyelid with the obicularis, the ones that close the eyelid. This of the obicular, the levator muscle is the muscle I was calling the Mueller's muscle, which is a smooth muscle supplied by sympathetic. It's a, not a very strong muscle, but is responsible for like two millimeters of the eyelid opening. Um, when when you somebody has a, a condition like Horner's, uh, I mean syndrome, then there is the develop maltosis of like two millimeters because of the sympathetic uh, innervation uh, problem. For me, of course, you know the eyebrow. Uh, you, you know the the lashes. You can see the lashes there on the temporal side. Superotemporal side of the orbit is there there will be a lacrimal gland which opens on the phonesis. The phonesis are the recess under, under the, under the recess under the eyelid. Uh, the lacrimal gland is on the temporal side, but the lacrimal drainage system, the drainage system is where the tears go. The lacrimal drainage, outside, outside you can only see on the lacrimal drainage system, you can only see the, the punctum. But of course, it's a whole system. There is the upper punctum and there is a lower punctum. After the punctum, there is a canalicular, which has a vertical element, and then has a more or less horizontal element. Uh, this is the upper canaliculi. And then the lower lid, you have also the lower canaliculi. They come and meet at the medial canthus. They form what you call the common canaliculi. Uh, 
itself. So from the lacrimal sac, the tears drained through the nasolacrimal duct to the posterior, to the, uh, to, to the, no, no, the nose, the inferior uh, meatus of the nose. Okay, so this is, uh, that, that, that uh, you can see also, we say the lid margin itself has a part, there is the anterior part which has the lashes, and then there is a posterior part of the lid margin which touches the eyeball. And uh, on the mid posterior part, we have the meibomian a part of the lead margin, okay? So those are things, that's the surface anatomy. Those are things that you can see by just looking at the, at the eye, the eyelid. What is the function of the eyelid? Uh, the eyelids are very important. First of all, they offer a mechanical protection of the anterior part of the globe. Uh, if something is getting to the eye, the first instant, I mean, the first reaction for somebody is to close the eyelid without even uh, thinking much because uh, they are very important. And is that they, they, they help in maintaining a tear film over the conjunctiva and the cornea. Uh, the conjunctiva and cornea should always be moist. If they dry, then there is a lot of trouble in the eyes. So, and for that to happen, the tear film is a uh, there is a very uh, there is a film of tears which has to stay there between the each and every blink. Uh, and of course, you can remember, you, you, you know, the eyeball itself, the position of the eyeball in to stay there without uh, dropping, without uh, breaking. Then it has to have a lot of, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of, um, there, there, there's a lot of things that are involved in the tear film to remain stable. And the most important thing is that after every few seconds or even within a second or two, uh, somebody has to blink. And once they blink, then they spread the tear film again on top of the eyeball. So that is the most important, that's very, 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 very important. Now, it, we, we've, most, um, we've said that the eyelid also contains meibomian gland and the meibomian gland produce an oil substance, which is very important for the tear film. As I told you, the tear film is not just water, it is a structure which has layers. The, the first layer is the mucus layer, which is uh, which attaches, which makes the uh, uh, which makes the surface of the eye uh, hydrophilic, such that the the, the 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 tears can stay. Then the other layer is the aqueous layer, which is mainly the water. Then the the the, the mucin layer is produced by the goblet cells. The oil, the watery layer is produced by the uh, lacrimal gland. And then on top of it to prevent evaporation is an oil layer. And that oil layer is produced by the meibomian glands. And as I said, the meibomian glands are found in the eyelids embedded into the tarsal plate itself. So of course we said that the, the, the eyelids also prevent the, the tears from uh, drying. And of course it also contains the first part of the lacrimal drainage system. We have talked about the puncta and the canalicula. Those are contained in the in the eyelid. So briefly, we get some examples of lid anomalies. Let's start with the ptosis. Ptosis is a droop, drooping of the upper eyelid. Uh, so, so it is an abnormality, abnormally low position of the upper eyelid. The main Causes, or there are several types of tosses, or depending on the on the etiology. This this is an etiological classification of of tosses. So one etiological factor is a mechanical factor. Mechanical means it's either the eyelid is too heavy or it is being pulled down by something. So uh, here we're talking about large eyelid lesions pulling the eyelid down. Lid edema. If the lid is edematous, of course it will have some tosses. Tethering. Tethering is a, a fibrous layer pulling the eyelid down, especially in scarring. And uh, one thing which is actually not a real tosis is called dermatocalasis, where the lid itself, the lid, the skin itself is too loose and then uh, covers the, uh, overhangs over the eyelid and it comes and covers the pupillary axis of the eyeball. Uh, of course, we have talked, uh, I mean, orbital lesions, anterior orbital lesions, they can cause a, a bit of ptosis. That is, in, those are mechanical factors that cause ptosis. 
Then the other category of ptosis is neurological ptosis or neurological factors. Neurological factors is innovation. Here we are talking about a, a third cranial nerve palsy because remember we said the, the eyelid is elevated by the levator palpebral muscle. The levator palpebral muscle is supplied by the third, I mean, by the third cranial nerve. So if you get a third cranial nerve palsy, of course, you'll get a, uh, the person who gets a third cranial nerve palsy, one of the presentation is the stosis. I've mentioned Honor syndrome, where there is a sympathetic uh, system innovation, I mean, uh, sympathetic system uh, lesion. Um, that, of course, does not cause a complete ptosis because the sympathetic system only accounts to two millimeters of the lead function. So they cause mild ptosis. There is a condition called a uh, Marcus gan jo winking syndrome. In Marcus gan jo winking syndrome, there is abnormal innervation. There is a abnormal connection between the nerves that supplies the muscle of mastication with the muscle of the, the levator muscle. So in that case, when somebody is trying to chew, then there is a movement of the, of the eyelid. So that is called the Marcus gan jo winking uh, syndrome. There is a tosis which gets worse when somebody is chewing, talking, or clenching the teeth. Uh, another type of uh, tosis, I mean, another category is the third nerve misdirection or disinnervation. This happens if there is a third cranial nerve palsy, and then during the reinnervation back, then the, the nerve take different uh, routes and they cause a problem. Remember the third cranial nerve is, supplies also other muscles like the medial rectus, superior rectus, inferior rectus, so, and of course the levator. So if there is a palsy and there is a, a renovation is happening, and then let's say the, the muscle or the nerve that uh, sub, was supplying the medial rectus finds itself supplying the, 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 the levator muscle. It means when somebody attempts to look on the medial side, the lead moves down. That is called uh, uh, the, 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 the third nerve uh, misdirection or uh, Reinnervation. I mean, uh, there's a problem of aberrant. There's another name is called aberrant reinnervation of the third cranial nerve. So uh, that is one of the causes. Of, those are those are the neurological causes of of tosis. Are we together up to this level? Yes, doctor. We are. Oh, good, perfect. Uh, then other tos, uh, kind of types of tosis is myogenic tosis. Myogenic means the problem itself is with the, with the muscle. Examples of, uh, of, of myogenic tosis is myasthenia gravis, uh, muscular dystrophies, chronic external thermoplegia, simple congenital tosis. That is a type of congenital tosis that causes that there is a problem with the, with the muscle and the blepharophimosis uh, syndrome. In those cases, the, the problem now, the cause of the tosis is, uh, is the muscle, is the problem is with the muscle itself. Then there is a poneurotic tosis. In a poneurotic tosis, uh, here we are talking about uh, the levator muscle, but the muscle itself is okay. But remember the muscle has a very long fi uh, fibrous layer, I mean fibrous part which is called the levator aponeurosis. Almost a third of the muscle is uh, aponeurosis. So now if there's a weakness on that fibrous layer, the aponeurosis itself, that can also cause uh, tosis. And that happens with age, that is called involutional aponeurotic tosis. That can happen after some surgery when somebody is trying to do eyelid surgery, and then they detach the aponeurosis from the eyelid, and that can also be uh, post-traumatic. So in short, again, uh, types of tosis or tosis etiologically classified into four, myogenic, uh, aponeurotic, neurogenic, and mechanical. Before you discuss tosis, you should always remember also something called pseudotosis. Pseudotosis is a false impression of, of tosis when they're actually not tosis. And that happens in several circumstances, uh, like if there is lack of support of orbital tissues, like if there is no eyeball in the globe, of course, the eyelid will fall down and it look like tosis. If there is an ophthalmos, which is uh, eyeball is displaced backwards, that's called an, an ophthalmos. If the eyeball is uh, thysico, thysico is when after severe trauma, the eyeball shrinks, then that is called thysis bulby or if the eyeball from birth is small, this is uh, microphthalmos. 
Uh, you can see like in this picture, when somebody covers the normal lie, the, the patient is actually able to open the, the eye that looked like it has ptosis because it was actually not ptosis. Uh, like in this case, there is a hypotropia. Hypotropia is the eyeball, I mean, the, the, there is a squint, strabismus where the eyeball uh, looks downwards or it's a downward squint. Uh, then there is what you call brow tosis or dermatocal and dermatocalasis. That is the eyebrow itself is displaced downwards and dermatocalasis, I mentioned, there is an extra thick uh, layer of skin, which is overhanging of the eyelid and this is called a dermatocalasis. So briefly on third cranial nerve palsy, I said the third cranial nerve is the one that supplies the levator muscle. Uh, and once it happens, then there will be tosses in most cases severe because it is contributes most of the uh, movement of the eyelid. Uh, the causes of that cranial nerve palsy, in most case, in around a quarter of cases is idiopathic, the causes are known, but other causes could be vascular. Uh, vascular causes are due to conditions like hypertension or under diabetes mellitus when there is a vasculopathy and because of vasculopathy, the nerve is no, not well supplied by the blood uh, and then causes uh, ptosis. In this case, and this is a very special type of ptosis because when it happens, in most cases, the pupil is, is paired. Remember the third cranial nerve is still the one that supplies the pupil. So when there is a, paralysis of the third cranial nerve, the pupil will be dilated. But if you see there is a third cranial nerve palsy and the pupil is paired, most likely this is vascular and it is from a vasculopathy from hypertension and diabetic mellitus. Uh, sometimes might be painful. Uh, traumatic cases, which can be direct trauma, that is the orbital trauma, or it can be direct, like in cases of subdural hematoma or ankle herniation. This one um, and also another type is from uh, aneurysm, especially of the posterior communicating artery in the brain. Uh, these two are called surgical. The first one, the one we are talking about vascular, we also call it mechanical, uh, medical cause of, of uh, third cranial nerve palsy. Then the, the trauma and aneurysm, this we call the surgical causes of third cranial nerve palsy. And the surgical causes are mostly uh, present with the pupil involvement. That's why if somebody has a head injury, you need supposed to look at you are supposed to look at the pupils, and if you see they are dilated, then you start suspecting conditions like subdural hematoma or or, or, or uh, yes, uh, inter intercerebral bleed. But again, if there is no trauma and the pupil is also involved, then you think about aneurysm, and of course you know aneurysm is very important. It needs to be handled uh, with care because it can rupture and cause a very bad complication. So other miscellaneous causes are syphilis, tumors, collagen, vascular disorders. Those are other causes of, of third cranial nerve palsy. In passing, I'll mention about myasthenia gravis. This is, this is a common autoimmune disease which antibodies mediate damage and destruction of uh, receptors of the striated muscles. So it is usually a systemic disease, but most cases starts with the eyelid. It starts with ptosis. It starts with the ptosis because the eyelid is the most, uh, among all the muscular uh, skeletal muscles, the most active is the eyelid because of the blink, blinking in every few seconds. And of course, even the extraocular muscles are also move, uh, very busy. So also can uh, squint and strabismus, which is variable, is also one of the present, early presentations of myasthenia gravis. So of course, uh, the destruction of the receptors of the striated muscle results in weakness and fatigability of skeletal muscles, but usually does not involve cardiac and other involuntary muscles. It's a more common, commonly affects females more than males. Uh, as I said, the, the myasthenia gravis can just present as ocular and remain ocular or can be ocular with the bulba. Bulba patients is, uh, they, they present with difficulties in swallowing, and then also can be generalized. Generalized patients with myasthenia gravis, they get easy fatigability when they are doing general things like walking, running, they can't run, uh, climbing the stairs, they can't, they get tired after a few, just a few, after a few steps. 
commonly from third decade, but they present even from the first year of life. Mm. I just stopped moving again. Uh, as I said, uh, my senior graphics ocular presentation is has happened. Uh, I think the presentation stopped sharing automatically. Let me look for it. Are we still okay. there? Uh, yeah, but I don't know. yes, I don't the know presentation is gone. Yeah, it has also gone from my screen. I don't know why. Mm. Uh, technical issues. Am I still in the meeting? Yes, you're still, we can hear you, but. We can't see anything. No, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I'm trying to open the presentation. Okay. I don't I don't know what happened. Anything you wanted to tell me? No, no, no. Oh, just... oh, okay.
Are you seeing the slides now? Yes. Okay, let me go to where we want. Okay, so we, we were talking about, I think we had finished the discussion about uh, myasthenia gravis. Uh, as I said, it, it commonly starts as a diplopy and tosis. Uh, and then of course, usually continues a, a painless fatigue. As I said, ocular involvement occurs in around 90% of cases and it is pre the only presenting feature is around 60% of course, uh, tosis. The tosis in uh, myasthenia gravis is usually insidious, slowly, uh, by slowly bilateral and usually asymmetrical. It is usually worse, it's, the patient is better during in the morning and it gets worse by the day goes by. To confirm the diagnosis, then a uh, endrophonium test is done where isotactin anticholinesterase is injected into the body and it increases the amount of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction. And that causes a dramatic improvement of the tosis. Uh, and that of course is transient. It's just a test. Treatment options are anticholinesterase, the dr uh, drugs like a peridostigmine and eustigmine. Uh, of course, it's an immunosuppress, I mean autoimmune disease. So immunosuppressants like uh, steroids, Azotherapy and cyclosporine are important. In severe cases, plasma exchange and intravenous immunoglobin. And uh, in some cases, they make tummy because in most cases, my senior graphics, when you do the CT scan of the chest, you'll see that the thymus is enlarged. And just the make tummy itself can cause a, a, a dramatic improvement of the symptoms. I mentioned again about Turner syndrome, where there is mild tosis from uh, impaired or uh, a problem with the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, Honor syndrome can be central, that is from the brain, like a brainstem disease, rigomyelia, lateral medullary syndrome, spinal cord tumors, or it can be preganglionic, that is just before the superior ganglion, where the relay of the nerves happens. These ones, uh, examples are pancos tumors, carotid or aortic aneurysms and the neck lesions. So if a patient presents with the symptoms of honor syndrome, then you have to be very careful because it could be a sign of a big problem like a carotid body tumor or a pancos tumor. Because like ganglionic is after the superior ganglion, superior cervical ganglion that is, and that presents with conditions like cluster headaches, internal uh, uh, carotid uh, dissection, nasopharyngeal tumors, otitis media, cavernous sinus masses. Uh, as I said, the patients with the Horner syndrome present with maltosis, that is almost like one to two millimeters because of weakness of the Miller muscle that I have already mentioned. A slight elevation of the lower lid, there is an equivalent of a Miller's muscle in the lower lid cause inferior tarsal muscle. I didn't mention that too much because it's not a very important muscle, but in some cases that can be noticed. Meiosis, because the sympathetic nervous system is the one which is responsible for causing the dilatation of the pupil. And in that case, if the, the, the is Horner syndrome, the pupil is, will be myotic. And there is an isochoria, and isochoria is the different sizes of pupil between the two eyes. The normal reaction to light, the, even though the pupil is myotic, it still reacts well to light and then to near vision. I mean, when somebody gets near, then the pupil is supposed to become myotic and that still happens. Um, there is in that, in cases of, uh, of honor syndrome, then the pup, the, there is a reduced sweating on that side of the, of the face. Uh, but that is only if, if, if the, the lesion is superior to the, the, below the superior ganglion. I'd already mentioned about Marcus Gagel-Winky syndrome, which is, a, which is a congenital problem. Uh, where there is an abnormal innervation of the pterygoid muscle and the, and the levator muscle that I've already mentioned. You can see like in this feature here, you can see the child looks okay when the mouth is open, when they close the mouth, you can see, you can notice a tosis on the left upper eyelid. That is Kamaka's Ganjo Winking syndrome. Simple congenital tosis is the commonest tosis that presents in children. It's the commonest uh, congenital tosis. 
It's usually unilateral, but can be bilateral. Uh, it's associated with very poor levator function. So the upper eyelid crease is usually not visible. And the lid remains, I mean, the totic lid remains higher in down gaze. Uh, and sometimes can be associated with superior rectus uh, weakness. So simple congenital ptosis is the commonest cause to type of ptosis that we get. Involution ptosis, I already mentioned that. We have said uh, involution ptosis is, is, is an aponeurotic ptosis. It's caused by age, age, and then the levator aponeurosis gets damaged with time. And then with that, uh, then there is ptosis. In this case, because the, the upper eyelid crease is usually higher than normal, and the levator function is usually uh, good. Sometimes it can be confused with myasthenia gravis because the ptosis gets worse during as the day worsens, by as the day proceeds, such that it's worse at the end of the day. Levator function in uh, involution of ptosis is usually good. Uh, Levator surgery is usually done for that. So that those are just uh, lesions. That's just tosis. So you can imagine there is so much uh, there is so much uh, to discuss when it comes to the eyelid. So we'll go to other uh, disorders of uh, positioning, and uh, we'll talk about entropion now. Entropion is the in inward turning of the eyelid. Uh, and because the, when the lid turns inside, the lashes start touching the eyeball, and when they touch the eyeball, they scratch it and they can damage the cornea. So patients uh, come with irritation from the lashes. This is common, uh, it's a, more, mainly an involutional condition, so it's common in older people, uh, but occasionally or sometimes it can be caused by scarring of the projectiva causing what we call cicatrical entropion. That is because of scarring. Uh, treatment, of course, so you start with the lubricating drops to, 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 to help the lashes from touching or scratching the eyeball, but permanently we need surgery to change the position of the lead margin. Ectropion is the opposite of entropion. Ectropion is the outward uh, evasion of the eyelid away from the globe. Uh, the, 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 only, the main problem, uh, this usually happens on the lower lid because of the laxity of the tendons around the eyeball. Again, it's age related, uh, but also can happen in conditions like facial palty because of the decreased tone of the uh, of orbicularis uh, muscle. Uh, sometimes also you can get a scar which pulls, now that become a cicatricial, uh, cicatricial ectopion. Uh, of course, the patient, the, the most common presentation is uh, apart from the exposure of the eye because it is unable to open close uh, completely, it is tearing because the tears, uh, the, if there is an ectropion, the punctum itself will also have an ectropion and there will be a lot of tearing. And then of course, the eyelid, like in the picture there, it's too wide open, so it dries up and gets irritation from the dryness uh, as opposed to irritation from the lashes in an entropion. Again, the treatment for an ectropion is surgery. Uh, very importantly, I cannot finish the lead discussion without up discussing apes zoster ophthalmica. Uh, apes zoster ophthalmica is caused by the varicera zoster virus. Uh, it usually should happen in patients who are elderly, but nowadays it, you can see it in young people because especially of immunosuppression. It used to be a very rare disease before the advent of HIV, but now it became very common. It has become less uh, common nowadays because of ARBs. So, but once in a while you might see it. Uh, of course, you remember the, the primary infection of the herpes zoster. I, I mean, it's usually in childhood with the primary small lesions or it could be on face, but now the recurrence happens when there is severe immun immunosuppression. As I said, in elderly or in patients with, with immunosuppressive uh, diseases, immunocompromised patients. The first symptom of the first thing that happens is the patient develop very severe pain before even the eruption comes. The pain is the most, is it's so severe, uh, such that some patients actually just present in hospital without even a lesion because of the severe pain. Then after that, the the rash now the, the rash now starts with the, the uh, and for upper zosta of famica, then it will have a distribution on the the area that is supplied by the first division of the ophthalmic nerve, that is the, the face. And the, it will never, it doesn't usually cross the midline. So there is a midline, you can see a line of demarcation at the midline. 
and then one side of the face is affected all the way to the eyelid itself. But also sometimes even the eyeball can be affected because it's also, it's, as I said, is the first division of the oculomotor which supplies the eyeball itself. So the eyeball pre can present in many ways. It can be a keratitis, it can be a conjunctivitis, episcleritis, uveitis. And then later, the, the, the patient with the, with, the, with the problem is not treated well, the patient develops a very bad uh, scar on the face and they can also develop what you call a post hepatic neuralgia. That is a very severe pain that is difficult to control. When the, the, the diagnosis should be made early because the early treatment prevents all these complications. Uh, the most important uh, treatment is oral cyclovir, which is given like 500 milligrams five times a day for at least uh, five, one week to two weeks. If it is severe, then IV acyclovir can be given. Others examples of medications that can be used is valacyclovir, pamcyclovir, and virals. Uh, once somebody has started with the uh, with the oral and virals, and the condition is looks controlled, then you can also add steroids to minimize the scarring and the trigger you know, neuralgia. Uh, for the skin lesions, you can add an acyclovir ointment and the bacitracin or antibacterial. Uh, ointment that is up as hostile uh, of thermica. Highly swellings, uh, we studied the commonest, which is a calasion. A calasion is a granulomatous inflammation of the neibomian glands, and uh, usually what triggers it is an obstruction of the neibomian orifices. We, we mentioned about the neibomian gland and the opening on the lead margin. So the openings are very tiny. So if for one reason or the other, the opening is blocked, then the gland continues to produce the oily substance and that induces an inflammation around it. So it's no longer an obstruction. It's not only an obstruction, but it's also an, an inflammatory condition. It's usually painless. And the patients usually see just a lid swelling on the lid, uh, on the eyelid. And the, in most cases, it actually resolves spontaneously. What we always recommend is when somebody notices the, the calasion early, they are supposed to start compressing it with, a, with something warm because you remember the meibomian gland produces some oily uh, secretions. So when you put a, a warm towel over it, then it, it melts a little bit. And once it melts, then it can, it can pass. And then once you put pressure, then uh, that can open the meibomian uh, gland orifice and then the drainage can start to open and the, it, it resolves. Well, if it doesn't resolve, then it can be, we do the irritation and curettage. That is surgery if the treatment, if the lesion is not resolving by itself. This has to be differentiated from odiolum. Odiolum is an infection now. It's an abscess. So an odiolum will look like, it might look like a, a calasion, but it is painful. And when you touch this tenderness and then there is surrounding swelling because the infection is not well defined, then it can cause swelling around that area and can cause some, a bit of cellulitis of the eyelid or what you call preceptor cellulitis. Uh, this one, of course, now needs an antibiotics and most likely uh, does it respond very well to topical antibiotics. Most likely you need to give an oral antibiotic and if it persists, then incision and curettage has to be done. The odiolum can be divided into two. It can be an external odiolum. That is, uh, it's a little bit anterior. You can see on this picture that you can even see where the pass is. This is an external odiolum. This usually comes at, around the lash line, around the lashes, where the lash is. Or it can be internal. Internal now is a little bit deep. You might not see the pass pointing and you, you palpate, you feel the skin on top is not affected, but it is deep. This is usually affected. The external odiolum affects the lashes and the, the and the, 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 the sebaceous glands, the internal odiolum is usually on the meibomian glands that I mentioned before. Again, the treatment is oral antibiotics, and if it is persistent, then you need incision and curettage. Uh, Molascum contagiosum is a common skin uh, lesion. It can affect, it's, an, it's a viral infection. It can affect um, any part of the skin, uh, sometimes affecting the eyelid itself. Uh, it, it has a typical umbilicated, we call it umbilicated appearance. Umbilicated means that there is a small depression at the center. 
if you look at it, you will see that a molluscan the contagiosum always has that kind of uh, thing. They just come start like one, and then because it's an infection spreads, and then they start resolving in most of the times by themselves. In sometimes then they don't resolve, then they can be uh, they can be removed or they can be cauterized or they can be the is what we call a chemical uh, cauterization or it can be cauterization with the thermal cauterization or can be removed with the laser so and that is if they are persistent in most cases they are self controlling if they affect the lead margin like in this case then it becomes more important that they are removed early if they don't if they are not affecting the lead then somebody can observe because they can be self controlling that's another picture of uh, that Santelasma, this just briefly, this is a deposit. The, the, this happens on the lid, especially on the superomedial side. You can see the two lesions of this patient. And they are usually, a, this is usually a cholesterol metabolism defect. So these patients, they have to test for cholesterol and if it's elevated, they are, then they are treated. Removal is only for cosmetic reasons because they don't have any problem. You can see this one as you all know the way like a, over the upper lid, uh, across into the lower lid, that is like Santelasma. <sighs> Are we together up to there? Yes, Dr. Kuya. Yeah, as I said, this is a big topic. So I hope we'll be able to, do we still have time? Because we've not even started discussing the orbit itself. Uh, yes, we can go on. We can. We can go on, eh? Yes, it's okay. Okay, okay. So, that was just the eyelid. Eh? Uh, now let's let's let's. When what what is the orbit? Uh, I already mentioned about the orbit a little bit. This is the structure. This is a cavity, and the cavity. When you're discussing the orbit, we discuss the the structures that are inside that cavity that support the eyeball. So when you're discussing the orbit, we are not discussing the eyeball itself. We are talking about the structures that support the eyeball. We are talking about. Uh, the blood vessels that go to the eyeball. We are talking about the extraocular muscles that move the eyeball. We are talking about the orbital fat that cushions the eyeball from uh, pressure. We are talking about the orbital bones that protect the eyeball from injury from the side. Uh, so those are the things, the optic nerve, which supplies, which, which takes away, I mean, the, which uh, carries the, the vision uh, nerves to the brain. So the orbit, we are talking about the supportive structures of the eyeball. So, of course, uh, from your anatomy, I'm sure you have done orbital bones. Uh, you, you know the orbital walls, the superior, the medial, let, let me, okay. the superior orbital wall, this one here, the medial orbital wall, this one here, you, you remember the frontal bones, the greater wing of the sphenoid. You remember, you should be able to remember the maxillary bone, the lacrimal bone, the, 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 the ethmoid bone, uh, the you, the floor that those are the making the, the medial wall. Uh, the medial wall, the floor of the orbit is made from the zygomatic bone on the other side, the maxillary bone on the other side, and a small palatine bone around here. The lateral wall, of course, is made by the zygomatic bone, as you can see, and the lesser wing of the sphenoid. In the orbit itself, you can see the optic canal, uh, the superior orbital fissure. You can only see the inferior orbital fissure around this area. So this is something you need to revise. Those are the orbital walls I've already mentioned. And of course, when you're talking about the orbit, we cannot ignore the sinuses. The sinuses are not part of the orbit, but they are so close to the orbit. The, there are so many con conditions that affect the sinuses and in one or the way the other, they come and affect also the orbit. So the sinuses are very important and you're discussing the eyeball. So most of the times we just mention them in passing. You can see, you know the categories of the sinuses during UNT, you discuss that the ethmoidal sinuses, maxillary sinuses, frontal sinuses, and sphenoid sinuses. So of course, when you discuss the uh, orbit, orbit, the most important thing what that comes to mind is proptosis. Because any small swelling in the orbit will cause the eyeball to be displaced. And the forward displacement of the eyeball is called proptosis. Um, in some, uh, there are some people who call it exophthalmos, which is basically the same thing, but I don't know why, but in ophthalmology, you like the term proptosis. So as we discuss the orbit, then most of the time we'll be, discuss, we'll be talking about uh, proptosis. But as we discuss proptosis, there are some things, uh, just to make things a bit easy, 
they are the seven P's of proptosis that we need to, to, to have in mind. What are these seven P's of proptosis? We are talking about pain, proptosis itself, progression, palpation, pulsation, perorbital changes, and pupillary reflexes. Pain is very important because, um, as you all know, uh, a proptosis is a swelling. So if there is a swelling which is painful, then what do you think about? You're thinking about infectious diseases or non-infectious inflammation. And infectious inflammations are called uh, autoimmune conditions. Uh, again, another painful condition is malignancy, but malignancies are painful during the late phases, not early phases. We don't use pain to know whether a lesion is malignant or not, because the pain in malignancy is a late presentation. When I'm talking about the P of proptosis here, you're mentioning the direction of the proptosis. Is it forward uh, displacement? That means that the lesion is the orbital apex. Is it lateral displacement? It means the lesion is medial. Is it uh, superior displacement? It means the lesion is inferior and uh, so forth so, and, and, and uh, so on. So progression means, is it slowly progressing or fast progressing? A slowly progressing lesion most likely is a, is a benign lesion. A uh, fast progressing lesion, it's either an inflammation or a malignancy. Palpation is very important, and you know that with the, from what you discuss in uh, surgery. Palpation, you, by the time you finish palpation, you feel if there is any mass, if there is a mass, you define the mass. Is it soft? Is it hard? Is it firm? Is it tender? Is it warm? Is it more, uh, mobile? Is it fixed to underlying tissue? Is it fixed to overlying tissue? So palpation tells you a lot, a lot, a lot. You look also for pulsation, and as we talk about pulsation, we also talk about breathe. Pulsation will mean that the lesion is either very vascularized or it has an, it's an heavy malformation, a travenous malformation. Uh, we'll mention ultravenous malformation as we continue. Uh, if there is an heavy malformation, if there is on, on not only pulsation, but there will be a brie on auscultation. Periorbital changes is what you see on inspection. It's just like you do in surgery when you see when you're inspecting a, a mass, then you have to define how is the mass, how big is it, uh, what is the color, is there any color change, or is it well-defined or poorly defined, if it's ulcerated or not ulcerated, if it's ulcerated, how are the margins, are they elevated, is it infected, are there other changes around there, is there telangiectasia? So you have to, to define what you see. Pupillar reflexes are very important, they tell us about, well, number one, the function of the optic nerve, and number two, they can tell us about the third cranial nerve. We mentioned the third cranial nerve. Palsy will cause a pupillary dilatation, but in that case, the pupil, the vision will still be good. But in that in a optic nerve palsy, the pupil will not only be dilated, but there will be no vision because uh, the afferent fibers for the, the 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 pupillary reflex goes with the optic nerve, and they go together with the nerve that supplies the vision. So in that case, if there is a if the pupil is dilated and there's no vision, most likely we are dealing with a with a with a with a, with a, with an optic nerve problem. I'm not going to details of a relative pupillary defect. Uh, that one we'll discuss maybe when we're in sixth year. So, what are the possible causes of proptosis? As you talk about the causes, then we so we can also categorize it uh, to, into acute, subacute, and chronic. Acute is in within two weeks. What can cause proptosis in around two weeks is, for example, a orbital cellulitis, a pseudotumor. Pseudotumor is an autoimmune inflammation of the orbit. Uh, that name is not used nowadays. We call it idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease. Retobarba hemorrhage, that is bleeding behind the eyeball and malignancies. Then malignancies, we examples are abdomyosarcoma, adenocystic sarcoma of the lacrimal gland or metastatic tumors. We'll mention briefly on that. Subacute causes uh, conditions like thyroid obitopathy, lymphomas. Then chronic, uh, here we are talking about benign lesions. Benign lesions could be vascular malformation. Malformations are not tumors. These are just abnormal collection of blood vessels or uh, uh, abnormal function of blood vessels like varices. There is a uh, dilated veins. Lymphadiomas are lymphatic malformation and the mangiomas will mention a few of them. Uh, we are talking about benign neural lesions like optic nerve glioma, meningioma, or schwannomas. Uh, we can talk about the benign bony lesions like osteomas and osteofibrous dysplasia, lacrimal gland tumors, adenomas, benign, 
Uh, then, of course, uh, lesions from surrounding structures. In this case, the nine lesions will be sinus, mucosal from the sinuses that are surrounding. Lymphomas, again, can be acute, subacute, can be chronic. So they, are, they belong to everywhere. Investigations, if you see a patient with proptosis, what are you supposed to do? The baselines are very important, of course, for lymphogram, UNDs, and uh, the etc. Abdomen orbital ultrasound is usually not done much. Orbital X-ray again not done much, but most importantly, you can do a CT scan or an MRI. You can see from this picture very well defined lesions in the orbit. You can see the orbit itself, apart from the extraocular muscles, which you can hardly see in this picture, and the optic nerve, you can see a bit of it here. The rest should be uh, dark like this because it's fat. But you can see a whitish lesion, which is homogeneous to brain in this orbit with a bit of proptosis. So CT scan is very important. So is an MRI. And if you see a lesion and it cannot be understood, then a biopsy is very important. Uh, briefly, let's discuss a few conditions of the orbit. Uh, let's start with the infections. When you talk about infections of the orbit, we always try to categorize it as preceptor cellulitis and orbital cellulitis per se. Preceptor cellulitis is not an orbital cellulitis per se, but it is cellulitis of the eyelid. We try to con discuss it with the orbit because sometimes it's difficult to differentiate between preceptor cellulitis and orbital cellulitis, and it's a very important thing you know. We call it preceptor cellulitis because the cellulitis is anterior to the orbital septum. The orbital septum is a fibrous layer that separates the eyelid from the orbit is tissues. It, is, it controls the spread of infection from the eyelid into the deep into the orbit. In the preceptor cellulitis, as I say, the globe and the orbit, the deeper orbit is not involved. So it is a, it's an anterior cellulitis. Usually follows uh, skin laceration, insect bite, just mild infections, but also can be spread from uh, lacrimal sac or can be spread from the from uh, the sinuses. Uh, preceptor cellulitis, the patient might have a fever, but it's low grade. They present with eyelid swelling and edema uh, and erythema, but as opposed to orbital cellulitis itself, orbital cellulitis, as opposed to orbital cellulitis, the vision will be intact, the pupils will be intact, the ocular motility will be intact. So those are differentiating factors between orbital cellulitis and preceptor cellulitis. There is no proptosis in the preceptor cellulitis. The extraocular motility is free in, in this, uh, in a orbital cell, a preceptor cellulitis. The extraocular motility is free. Uh, the vision is okay. And uh, definitely the eyeball is normal. So that is a preceptor cellulitis. A preceptor cellulitis, if it's not severe, then can be treated as home as outpatient with oral antibiotics, warm compressive, non specific, non steroid anti inflammatory medications. If there is an abscess, then it can be drained. Uh, if, if they develop an abscess, then, then that can also be drained. If severe, then a uh, patient can be admitted for IV antibiotics. Orbital cellulitis itself. It's a severe infection in the orbit. Uh, uh, so in this case, the eyeball and the orbit are involved, but also the eyelid because they are there, they, in most cases they are swollen. That's why I was telling you that it's difficult to differentiate sometimes unless you are very keen. Etiology of orbital cellulitis, uh, predisposing factors are conditions like sinusitis and upper respiratory tract infection. In more than 90% of cases of orbital cellulitis, they come from the sinuses. Also, they can spread from the dental caries, from trauma, from orbital surgery. The most common bacteria, again, they are the ones that cause infection in upper respiratory tract, like strep pneumonia and Haemophilus influenza, or skin infection like Staph aureus. Uh, occasionally, you can get uh, fungal infections like mucomycosis, which usually happens in patients who are highly immunosuppressed, like in diabetic heterocidosis. And of late, patients who are taking uh, steroids or patient of, of late, even COVID has been associated with mucomycosis. Uh, so as I said, the, the inflammation in orbital cellulitis in the orbital, uh, the orbital cavity, this I think is a repetition. Uh, since the fever will be high grade, the patient will be very sick, proptosis usually unilateral, they might have chemosis that is swollen of the conjunctiva, the motility, Extraocular motility I've mentioned will be affected. There will be pain of movement of the globe. 
there will be reduced vision, then they could be pupillary reflexes, they can be uh, affected. Uh, ex examination, of course, you check the vital signs, uh, neurological exam, in case the infection has spread into the brain. And then uh, investigations could include a CT scan of orbit and paranasal sinuses, uh, full blood count with the differentials. Uh, and, and so treatment, of course, an orbital cellulitis is a very bad condition. You'll get, I'll let you know about the complications that can happen. So the patient has to be admitted. The treatment is admitted, uh, is, is inpatient. If you are not very comfortable with it, you need to refer the patient uh, urgently to an ophthalmologist. Uh, IV broad spectrum antibiotics that uh, cover both gram negative and gram positives. Uh, uh, examples are pisiline, salbactam, nafcilin. Well, commonly, we have amoxicillin with clavulanate. That is augmenting or third generation capillospolin like ceftriaxone. So, so the ones we have mainly. Uh, topical does not have a big role. If there is an abscess, of course, has to be drained. And I said 90% uh, of, 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 of orbital cellulitis is from the sinuses. So you have to treat with the ENT specialist on board. Prognosis is good, but some complications I mentioned, orbital apex syndrome, which means that the orbital apex, the vision is gone and the eye cannot move at all because all the nerves of the orbital apex are compressed. Uh, the patient, the infection can go to the cavernous sinus causes, uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis is a life-threatening condition. Some cases it can cause uh, meningitis, brain abscess, septicemia, and some patients have died from orbital cellulitis. As I was saying, you need to pick it early do, and do the right thing. Um, briefly on thyroid obitopathy, thyroid, uh, it's, it's thyroid obitopathy or thyroid related obitopathy is the manifestation of patients with Graves' disease or uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the effect that, that causes into the, into the orbit. Uh, these are very common because uh, thyroid obitopathy is the most common uh, cause of proptosis in the world. Uh, affects male, female to male in the ratio of 8 to 1. This is the same ratio of Graves' disease. In, in most cases, there is hyper, in most cases, there is hyperthyroidism, but you can naturally guess thyroid obitopathy when the, the normal thyroid hormones levels, or in some cases, they can even be low. That is called your thyroid if it's normal or hypothyroid thyroid obitopathy. Uh, signs of thyroid obitopathy, they are classified into the eyelid ones, soft tissue, and the nerve, uh, optic nerve uh, problem. So eyelid uh, signs include the uh, lid retraction. Lid retraction is abnormal lifting of the upper, mostly upper lid, but it can be also on the lower lid. That makes them to have that staring look, or they look like they're scared, or they're staring at something. So that is uh, the, the, the lid retraction. And also they also develop a lead, lead lag in down gaze. When the patient tries to look down, uh, like in this case, you can see the left eye, the, 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 when the patient looks down, the upper eyelid follows the eyeball down. That is, uh, that's the ideal way. But on the right eye, the patient still looking down, but the eyelid, the upper eyelid has left, uh, been left up. That is low, called lead lag on down gaze. Soft tissue involvement, that is, uh, Periobital changes, and that is like periobital swelling, like in this case. Uh, you can also have conjectival hyperemia, or you can have conjectival chemosis, that is swelling of the conjectiva. You can see it here. And then you can see the superior limbus. Limbus is the junction between the sclera and the cornea, is inflamed in this case. This is called a superior limbic eratoconjunctivitis. Those are soft tissue lesions. Uh, then there is an eyeball problem, that is the proptosis. In most cases, it's forward proptosis. We call it axial proptosis. Uh, then there is optic nerve. I did mention it there. That's called optic neuropathy. Patients who develop optic neuropathy, then they need to be, uh, they can lose vision very fast. These patients, in most cases, we don't do anything, but if it is advanced, like you can see these cases where there is chemosis, pain, and all that, then you can give immunosuppression and um, immunosuppressive medications. Uh, the treatment of the thy thyroidism itself doesn't affect the, the, the presentation of the uh, orbit per se, because the orbit itself is also inflamed. It is not the thyroid hormones causing the effect in the orbit, it is the inflammation. So they need immunosuppressive uh, treatment. 
and the early treatment also these fat lead uh, like patient with severe proptosis like this and the, the lead retraction then they can be treated uh, by surgery. Uh, I'll not mention too much about uh, orbital pseudotumor. Orbital pseudotumor, as I said, is a non-specific autoimmune inflammatory condition of the orbit. So the patient presents with proptosis, pain, redness, just like orbital cellulitis, but this one is, is autoimmune. So they, again, they may look like uh, the orbit, but the, the sense of infections are not so much. Uh, but there is also, of course, I said there is a proptosis, there is edema. So it's very difficult to differentiate it from proptosis. Uh, so sometimes we actually, I mean, from uh, orbital cellulitis. So sometimes we try to treat orbital cellulitis with zero responding, then we go for treatment for pseudotumor. And the treatment is uh, mild cases are observed, but severe cases are given as systemic steroids. And some cases, radiotherapy and the cytotoxic medications can be given. Uh, did I even finish? I don't think so. Are we still together? I think you have just a few slides to finish. Yes, we are still together. This is a lot of information. Maybe, are you recording? You might have to discuss it to, to look at it later. Yes, I'm recording. Okay. Will you okay. kindly also share the presentation with me on the email? Yes, I will share just now after you finish. Okay. Thank you. So I mentioned about the pseudotumor or idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease. Oh, I think we are, what we have not discussed today is the orbital masses. I think that one I had removed because it makes it uh, orbital tumors. It makes the, the presentation too long. What we'll do is uh, during your rotation in the clinic, I have a presentation for orbital tumors I have already presented it to one group. There's a group which was there. I, I made the presentation last week. So yes. you make sure that we get the, you, you listen to the presentation of uh, when you are rotating during your rotation, uh, during the Monday rotation. Do you have a group that is supposed to be with us, with me today? Just check for me, then they, they contact okay. me. We plan for the discussion of orbital tumors. So orbital yes. tumors is a different one. We'll have to do it later. Okay, it will be an online discussion though, yes? Yes, it's also online, it's also online. Okay. Unless you want us to do a whole class like this, which one is best? Uh, I will discuss with the class rep for the group that is supposed to have that discussion with you. If mm -hmm. they don't mind, we can do the whole class and I can record it we as well. We can do the whole class and have it once and for all. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you. So I think we come to the end of the, the discussion today. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Recording stopped.